Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jonathan Savage and in the early hours of Monday the 13th of September, these are our main stories. The FBI has released a heavily redacted report into alleged links between the Saudi government and the 9-11 plot. UN nuclear inspectors have been given permission to service surveillance equipment at sites in Iran after what's been described as constructive talks in Tehran. Pope Francis has urged Hungarians to open their arms to the needy, an apparent criticism of the allegedly xenophobic policies of their Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. Also in this podcast, in Lebanon, political power is restored. Now for keeping the lights on. He opened at 8, closed at 8.30, because the power went out. We asked him, why have you closed? He said, I don't have a generator. And 10 years after winning the World Cup, Japan finally gets a fully professional women's football league. Fifteen of the September the 11th attackers came from Saudi Arabia. But any suspicion of official Saudi involvement was always strenuously denied by the authorities in Riyadh. That suspicion has persisted for 20 years, though, not helped by three US presidents refusing to release classified documents on alleged links between the terrorists and the Saudi government. Enter President number four. Joe Biden has ordered the FBI to release so far one of the documents. It's still partially censored and what we can see provides no clear evidence to support the speculation. Just what does the document tell us then and how significant is it? Questions for our US correspondent Peter Bose. This document goes into some detail about the alleged contacts between a Saudi national in the United States and two of the 9-11 attackers. Remember those responsible for the attack? 15 of the 19 were from Saudi Arabia. They entered into the US in the year 2000. There's always been suspicion from the families of the victims that they must have had considerable amount of, of help to assimilate into this country and orchestrate the attack. And this document begins to address that, although there is much of it that is redacted or censored, so we don't get the full story. But there are 16 pages of this FBI memo based on interviews with a source whose identity hasn't been revealed. And the memo outlines contacts between a number of Saudi nationals and two of the hijackers and says they received significant logistical support, things like translation, travel, lodgings, financing, support from a Saudi national called Omar al Bayomi, who witnesses say was a frequent visitor to the Saudi consulate here in Los Angeles, purportedly a Saudi student in Los Angeles, but whom the FBI suspected of being a Saudi intelligence agent. So why was this document released now? Well, there's obvious significance in, symbolic significance in the document, this memo being released on the day of the 20th anniversary of the attack. And it appears to have been prompted by a letter written by more than 1,600 people affected by the attacks to President Biden, asking him to refrain from going to Ground Zero in New York City to mark the anniversary unless he released this information. And the actual release followed a review of the documents by the Justice Department. And this, of course, is something the families have long been demanding. And and President Biden does seem to have a, a different attitude towards the investigation than, as you mentioned, his immediate predecessors, the administrations of George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, all declining to declassify these documents, citing national security concerns. Peter Bowes. Now, it's been three years since Donald Trump withdrew the US from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. In that time, the United States has increased sanctions and Iran has responded by breaking some aspects of the agreement. All that has raised fears that Tehran may produce weapons-grade nuclear fuel, But a meeting on Sunday between Iran's atomic energy chief, Mohammad Eslami, and Rafael Grossi, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, may have eased some of those fears. Here's Mr Grossi. 
This visit had a very clear technical emphasis, the continuity of the operation of the agency's equipment here, which is indispensable for us to provide the necessary guarantees that everything is in order. I got more details from our Middle East analyst, Alan Johnston. As Mr Grossi, the uh, head of the IAEA, flew to Tehran, his biggest worry would have been access to some Iranian nuclear sites, some facilities for which the Iranians have been barring inspectors for, for months now. But there was an agreement, and it is that the inspectors should be allowed to go back to those particular sites and they will be able to service equipment, cameras that have been running in the absence of the inspectors. Fresh memory cards will be put on. But reading between the lines, it doesn't look like the inspectors will be able to read the data already collected. Perhaps that will be done at another stage. So there was progress, there was an agreement, even if it was only a rather partial-seeming one. Yes, and it does seem quite technical uh, to an extent, Alan. Is is there greater significance to it? I think it was important that some progress at least was made. There's a big IAEA meeting in Vienna. If there'd been no cooperation, then I think you would have had uh, Iran being very seriously criticised. That would have hardened uh, feeling on both sides, further uh, undermined trust. But, but even if this agreement is nothing like any comprehensive solution to the technical issues raised, then at least something has been achieved and some pressure perhaps Relieved. In Tehran, there is a new harder line government. Why do you think they have decided to agree to this move when they could take a tougher stance if they wanted to? It's hard to know for sure, but as one of our colleagues in the Persian service was saying, it looks as if the Iranian government has decided to keep the door open, at least, as he put it. The, the Iranian Government is now, in, as you say, in the hands of hardliners who have been deeply, deeply sceptical of the whole business of negotiating with the West. They're contemptuous of the, the way the US under President Trump scrapped the deal uh, and all the rest of it. But those sanctions are hurting the Iranian economy. There would be big advantages if those sanctions could be lifted, if a deal could somehow be struck. Alan Johnston. The first ever professional women's football league in Japan has kicked off. It has ambitions both on and off the pitch, as Michael Bristol reports. The league has 11 teams, each with at least 15 players on professional contracts. The aim is to re-energise the game in Japan, which has traditionally done well at international level. Promotional videos, though, make it clear that this is about more than just football. The organisers want the new league to become a driving force for gender equality in Japan. Its official name is the Women Empowerment League. Half the staff on each team has to be female, and there must be at least one woman on every club board. Stadiums need daycare facilities for players with children and to encourage families with youngsters to come and watch. Recent Japanese governments have pledged to improve the position of women in society, but not always with success. Japan is closing the gender gap far slower than other developed nations. For the league to inspire women to break down barriers, there'll probably have to be drama and excitement on the pitch. There was certainly some of that in the first round of matches on Sunday, and plenty of fans to enjoy it. Michael Bristol. Still to come, a musical welcome for the Pope in Hungary. But immigration has Francis and Prime Minister Orban singing from different hymn sheets. In our earlier podcast, we reported on the birth of a new global tennis star, 18-year-old Briton Emma Raducanu, who won the US Open, becoming the first qualifier ever, male or female, to win a Grand Slam event. When Emma travelled to the US from her home in Bromley in South London, she was ranked 150th in the world. And she thought it so unlikely she'd qualify for the tournament, let alone win it, that if she'd taken the return flight she booked, she'd have been back in Bromley two weeks ago. 
Laura Scott reports on the new tennis sensation and the effect she's having back home in the UK. The rankings still need updating, record books rewriting and plans for how to welcome Britain's newest sporting sensation back to the UK formulated. Debates continue about whether her extraordinary performance, lifting the trophy without dropping a set in 10 matches and as a qualifier no less, makes it the greatest ever sporting achievement. For the 18-time Grand Slam winner Martina Navratilova, a star has undoubtedly been born. It's ridiculous how well she has done. I don't go into superlatives very much. Uh, I really tell it like it is, which is, I think, why people like to listen to me. I'm blown away, truly. She's a spectacular tennis player and she's going to be a superstar. There were early signs of an Emma effect. At the Bromley Tennis Centre where she trained as a youngster, the phones haven't stopped ringing and the courts were full of children keen to get to work emulating the teenage star. One of Raducanu's former coaches, Matt James, outlined the positive impact it could have on inspiring the next generation. She will have inspired a lot of players to pick up a racket, but also flipping it, the players, the current prop who are looking to break through, you know, this will inspire them, hopefully, that they can do it because it's such a whirlwind. You know, they've been practising with her and seeing her for the last few years. You know, why not have you know, a few more players in the top 100? When the new world rankings come out, Raducanu will be number 23 in the world from 340 at the start of 2021. She'll also officially become the British number one. Tennis has a relatable, fearless young role model. Laura Scott. Pope Francis has urged Hungarians to open their arms to the needy, an apparent criticism of the allegedly xenophobic policies of their Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. The Pope was en route to Slovakia and briefly stopped off in Budapest. He celebrated Mass in Heroes Square. Dominus Loviscum. Sursum Corda. Gracias, hagamos Domino Dio Nostro. Our Budapest correspondent Nick Thorpe told my colleague James Kumarasamy what came out of the brief meeting between Pope Francis and Mr Orban. A statement by uh, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, on his Facebook post uh, beneath a picture of him shaking hands with Pope Francis and uh, a message from Mr Orban there. I asked Pope Francis not to let Christian Hungary perish. Of course, in Mr Orban's kind of um, approach to the world, what that means, you know, is Christian Hungary under attack? And what we know from all the years Mr Orban has had in office, he often portrays Um, himself as a defender of Christian Hungary and Christian Hungary, as he puts it, or Christian Europe, under attack from outsiders, from uh, liberalism and from Muslim refugees. On the other hand, we have from the, uh, the message from the Pope, not so much from the meeting with Mr. Orban, but in his address to that mass attended by tens of thousands of people in a very hot day, in Hero Square, he said, um, the cross urges us to keep our roots firm, but without defensiveness, to draw from the wellsprings, uh, opening ourselves to the thirst of the men and women of our time. My wish is that you be like that, grounded and open, rooted and considerate. And of course, putting that in the context of what we know, the Pope's message reiterated Time and again, this openness that he's speaking about not to be defensive, which, of course, uh, is very much what Mr. Orban has done by building a wall on, on the southern border of Hungary. And in Budapest itself, perhaps a, a more receptive audience? First of all, one has to say that there were tens of thousands of Christians, Hungarian Catholics, but Catholics from all around the world who were attending that mass as the climax of a week of prayer, uh, a Eucharistic Congress, which is only held every four years. So uh, very much a message of faith and prayer to those people. But of course, the city of uh, city council of Budapest is in the hands of the liberal or left-wing opposition. They had a particular message of welcome to the Pope in their city, saying there were large billboard posters around the city welcoming the Pope with his own quotations, quotations in which Pope Francis has in a way shown his 
what they would see as liberal credentials standing up for human dignity, human rights and things that the opposition in Budapest feel the current government is trampling on. And why might the Pope have spoken about the threat of anti-Semitism still lurking in Europe and elsewhere today? Yes, this was at his meeting with Hungarian bishops and leaders of the Hungarian Jewish community, which remains one of the biggest Jewish communities in Europe. And there, of course, Hungary is a country which lost so many of its Jews to anti-Semitism, to the Holocaust. Um, And while Mr. Orban today uh, underlines that his policies and so on are not anti-Semitic, his critics would point to, for example, his campaigns against the uh, Hungarian-born financier George Soros as being having a kind of slight anti-Semitic message, or that that would be how they would be interpreted by many Hungarians. Nick Thorpe. Lebanon may have just announced a new government over a year after the previous administration quit following the Beirut port explosion, but it remains in an economic crisis that has plunged it into darkness. It's now desperately short of fuel. Some people are experiencing power cuts of 20 hours a day, while motorists queue for hours to fill their tanks. The British embassy in Beirut has repatriated diplomats because of the fuel shortage, and hospitals have cut back essential services. From Beirut, our Middle East correspondent Quentin Somerville reports. In Lebanon's southern city of Sidon, it's as dark as a tomb. There's barely been electricity for a week. In the city's old passageways, locals use phone lights to cut through the gloom. With no fuel, even generators have stopped working. There, surrounded by candlelight, is Hassan Hosho. I take medication for a chronic disease. I was told we can get it in Beirut, but for double the price. And still couldn't get it. We can't even find cough medicine and Panadol. Everything is running short, the currency is now worthless and most people's savings have disappeared in the financial crisis. Last week bread was in short supply, this week it's bottled water. Ali Sharma is another side in resident. We don't have a state at all. This man in the presidential palace should be burned in alcohol. Is this a life? I had to go back for two packs of bread, one for me and one for my daughter, and it's not cheap. Hoarding has become commonplace. At a petrol station in Sidon, a confrontation between the army and locals. Things are so desperate, troops have been deployed at petrol stations across the country. Ten days we come to this petrol station and they say there's no petrol. The government checked and it turned out he has 24,000 litres. He was ordered to open. He opened at 8, closed at 8.30 because the power went out. We asked him, why have you closed? He said, I don't have a generator. But what of Lebanon's good times? At the Bossa Nova Hotel... There's a rooftop party around the pool. People are here to forget their troubles. The owner, Christine Ozier, built this business through two pregnancies. But after the currency collapse, the port explosion and now the fuel crisis, she's thinking of calling it quits. Some days, despite everything that's happening, I feel uh, kind of at peace because I feel like I'm doing my best and that my conscience is clear. And I don't know, there's an incredible strength in in people. But when it comes to finding medicine, finding bread, things like that, it doesn't matter how resilient you are. For all its flaws, Lebanon still sparkled in the region. Its nightlife, its universities, its healthcare, all that was best is draining away. It's now an angry, melancholy place where life isn't lived, but it's a daily battle for survival. That report by Quentin Somerville. Zoo Atlanta in the United States says several of its gorillas have tested positive for coronavirus despite extremely rigorous measures to protect them. It's thought the great apes were infected by one of the keepers who wasn't showing symptoms. 
Harry Bly has been following the story. The zoo, which has its own gorilla care team, says keepers observed coughing and changes in appetite within the troop of western lowland gorillas. After tests came back positive, vets and doctors began treating the great apes, most at risk of developing complications, with artificially made antibodies, which bind to the virus and neutralise it, preventing it from spreading and multiplying. Now all of the gorillas are being regularly tested, regardless of symptoms, and the zoo has doses of a vaccine developed especially for animals, which will be given to some of its other residents, including orangutans, lions, tigers and leopards, as a precaution. The gorillas suffering from coronavirus will also get a dose once they're feeling better. Harry Bly. And that's all from us for now. But there will be a new edition of the Global News Podcast later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. Sam Ling did just that and had this to say about our podcast Remembering 9-11 20 Years On, which was presented by Valerie Sanderson. It really brought back the shock of that day drawing particular attention to the sacrifice of the emergency service men and women. And Sam adds, the podcast is packed with different news stories. Valerie Sanderson's gentle Scottish accent is easy to listen to, interesting questions and fascinating answers. These podcasts keep me well informed and I can fit them around my busy schedule. Thanks so much, Sam, for your comments. And hey, who doesn't love a Scottish accent? I'm Jonathan Savage. The producer of this podcast was Alison Davies. The studio manager was Mike Adley. The editor is Karen Martin. Until next time, goodbye. My name's Lise Doucette. February 13th, 1989. From my window, I can see the whole war in Kabul unfolding. Well, my voice has changed a little bit over the years, but I'm still reporting on Afghanistan. We've put together a podcast. It was much harder than we thought. It kept changing because Afghanistan kept changing with breathtaking speed. Lives turned inside out. In our 10 episodes, you'll hear stories from remarkable people whose lives have shaped events in Afghanistan, and events have shaped them. Mr. President, sometimes you said one thing in the morning and another thing no, in the evening. No, I was a decisive president. That's exactly what they didn't want. And now that this story is making headlines everywhere, you may be asking, what happens next? What happened before? I know I do. And these people can help us. I really did think that we will achieve peace and war will end. A Wish for Afghanistan from the BBC World Service. Search for A Wish for Afghanistan wherever you get your podcasts.